Well, recently we began a program called The Equip. It's a class that happens at the House of Faith, Overcoming Faith Church, Vicar Road, opposite Garden City Mall. Every Sunday, 9 o'clock, for about 45 minutes, we have a class called the Equip. And I want to invite you. It is about leadership and ministry. All of us have been called for some vision, some dream. There is a business, there is a ministry, there is a mission. There is something you want to accomplish. You need to come and learn very important principles that will help you and, uh, and strengthen your leadership skills and calling and also teach you how to do ministry. And we are connecting all this so that you can learn and be equipped to become what God wanted you to be. And for the, in this class also, you discover your purpose, you discover your calling, you discover why you are here. Somebody said there are two days in life. One, the day you are born, and second, the day you discover why you are born. Come to the equip class every Sunday at 9 at the House of Faith. And you will discover why you are here. God bless you and see you there. Second Timothy 2 and verse 1. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Verse 5. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Verse 6, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Father, give us understanding today in all things through your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Today I want us to focus on verse number five. If anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The principle here, because when you read the scriptures, one, you try to understand the context uh, upon which that scripture was written, the background. And the background of this we know, and I say it is Paul writing to his son Timothy, giving him some guidance on how to make it in ministry and life, how to succeed in doing ministry. Because Timothy is a son to Paul, not biologically, but a spiritual son. And therefore, after you understand the context, then you also look at the background. And the background here, I would say, is that Paul is working on raising sons, generations to come, so that the ministry, the work of the kingdom does not stop when one man is no longer here. Apostle Paul is not here today, but the gospel continues. Thank you for one amen. <laughs> and therefore, if Paul kept everything he had, 
we would not be having the revelation and the understanding we have. So he says, the things you have heard from me, from who? Paul. To whom? Timothy. Commit also to faithful people who will also commit to others. So there is a generational passing of understanding, knowledge, information, ministry, giftings, and callings. So there's no ending to this. It continues and it continues. Amen? So, th that is the background. Why Paul is saying these things to Timothy. In other words, he's saying, Timothy, I am an old man. When I'm gone, you, you look at that and uh, later you see him saying, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. You know, he's saying, I've done what I was supposed to do. So, Timothy, take up the baton and run. Run with this. I don't want to die with it. Because no one is successful until you have a successor. We are only successful if what we are doing, somebody else will take it up and run with it. But if somebody dies and all the head dies with them, then that's not success. Each one of us should fight for a legacy where we have a legacy where we, whatever we started, whether it's in ministry, business, family, other people can run with it and it will continue to other generations and generations and generations to come. I pray that God will help you and me that we will not just start something so small that it will only be managed by me, ran by me, done by me. So if me is not here, that thing is gone. God helping us, we will build something great, whether in the ministry, in business, in family, that is bigger than us, that other people will get it and catch it and run with it. Write your vision, make it plain. Others will see and run with it. Amen? That's the background. Now the principle, let's come to the principle now. The application. Because you understand the context. You look at the background. And now you come to where we are and ask ourselves. That's why he says, I pray that you understand these things. I'm not just writing about the soldier the interest of Paul here is not the soldier. His interest is not the farmer. We all know farmers. I mean, some of us have been farmers and all that. The interest here is not the runner. They are, they are 13. No. There are principles hidden here. And that's what we saw in verse this 6 where he says, understand, you know, get the understanding of these things. Understand the principle. Understand the the uh, the law, you know, what is hidden be beyond what you are reading. Because when we read the scripture, the Bible says that, uh, you know, the spirit gives life. The letter kill it because if you read the scripture like you are reading CRI or doing CRI, it doesn't help you. We have CRI teachers who are not born again. So the Bible for us is not CRI, Christian religious education. For us, it's revelation from God. It is the inspiration that it came through the Spirit of God. Amen. Are you with me? So the principle here he's talking about, when he says a runner, we're talking, talking of a runner that other team. And he says that he who runs, give me that verse again, verse, is it verse, verse 6? He who runs must run according to the rules. So you don't just run. There is a way to run. Okay, verse 5. And also if anyone competes in athletics 
So there is a competition. You are not running alone. But even if you are not running alone, we also need to know that everybody, each runner, have their own race. Amen? You can be 8, you can be 6, you can be 10, you can be 20, but each one of you, you have your own race. Somebody say, I have my race. So you are competing in athletics. He is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. In other words, you do not receive the reward until you compete according to the rules. You don't set the rules. The rules are set for you. And you are told, this is how we run. This is your lane. Your lane is number three. So focus on your reign. And when I was studying this, the principle I got from this scripture is the principle of focus. Every athlete, every runner, Kenya, we are known for running. And actually, even when we travel, some people think all Kenyans are runners. And you tell them, yes, you want to try? You want to compete with us? And they say, no, no, I cannot compete with a Kenyan. So they believe all Kenyans. If you go to Europe, America, Asia, they believe all Kenyans are runners. And we don't discredit, uh, discredit ourselves. We tell them, yes, we are runners. Though some of us can run 0 0.01 <laughs> miles per hour. But we are runners. Amen? Even if we don't run physically, we run with a vision. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of us run physically, others run with a vision. May you be the one who runs with a vision. May you be the one who runs with the vision of this house. May you be the one who will say, God helping me, the vision of this house will not die. I will catch the vision from the bishop, from the visioner or the visionary, and I will run with the vision of the house. Now focus. I tried to come up with an acronym name for FOCUS. FOCUS, how do you spell FOCUS? F-O-C-U-S. For you to FOCUS, one, you must follow. You must follow. That is for F. Because there is a lane marked for you. So you don't just run anyhow, zigzag, back and forth, right, left. No, you run according to the lane, the rules that are set for you. So you must, there are rules that you must follow. Or you must get organized. So it stands for organize. You cannot run when you're not organized. So you organize yourself. You put your mind to the race. Amen? You can't be here, you are running, and you are competing with others, and this is a serious competition. And then your mind is all over. Your mind is back home. Your mind is back to the office. Your mind is, you know, everywhere. No, 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 no. You must put your mind to what you are doing. Focus on what you are doing. Organize your mind, organize your body, organize your soul, your spirit, everything. Hallelujah. And I'll come to, at a later time, I'll come and teach you about, you know, body, you know, spirit, body, spirit, soul, and spirit. So that you can understand. Amen. But, but you see, organize, when you're running, it's not just the feet. Because sometimes we think it's the feet. It is the whole being running. It is your mind, it is the soul, it is the spirit, it is you put energy. Hallelujah. For us to succeed in ministry, in serving God, we have to put, we have to follow. There are rules, there are things that God has put and has given us. There are things that God has said we must do, you must follow this. This is a, the, the instructions that have been given. 
And there are people who will run, become number one, and they are disqualified because they did not follow instructions. There are people who should have learned and won, but they did not win because they were not organized. You never see somebody running and they are wearing gum boots. They're in a suit like me and a tie. You know, some of them almost run naked. You know, because they want to be light. Although some of, some of them, of course, they push it too far. <laughs> but, but you see, you want to be light. You remove every weight. If you are wearing a jacket, you put it down. That is part of organizing yourself. If you have shoes, you wear the most light shoes. You don't go there with a, with a leather shoe, with a, with a gum boots, with a whatever, with the boots, with the high heels. You never see somebody running in high. No, you can't. Organize yourself. Now, even in ministry, there is, there is a part where we have to get organized. Our God is a God of plan. He's a God of purpose. He's a God of structure. So there is that which, when God spoke to Moses, he said, build the temple according to the structure, the plan, the design that I showed you. Because he was saying, the structure you're going to build is the structure that is already in heaven. So I don't want you to just use your mind and think, uh, that's why God gave you, if you read about the building of the temple, God gave Moses the, the instructions and you wonder somehow he didn't leave him to think. He gave him even the colors, the measurements, the, the width, the breadth, the length, the height, everything, the colors and everything. The materials to use, where to use silver or bronze, because all of them are significant and they are, they, they are a representation, a leprica of what is in heaven. So ministry does not begin here and does not end here. And it begins in heaven and it ends in heaven. So ministry is a replica of the temple that we have in heaven. Worship is a replica of the worship we have in heaven. Are you with me this morning? So when we come here for worship, when we serve God, there is an ordained manner that God said, you cannot just serve me the way you think. You cannot worship me the way you like. You cannot fall, you know, worship me according to your traditions. You remember Jesus talking in, uh, you know, I think John 4 to the Samaritan woman. And, you know, and she's saying, you know, not the Samaritan, the, the, the woman at the well. You know, yeah, she's Samaritan. <laughs> Amen. Now I'm thinking about the good Samaritan. Okay. Now, and she's here. She's trying to justify this is how we worship according to tradition. And Jesus saying, no, no, no. That, that's not the way to worship. Now, God is seeking now the people who will worship in truth and in the spirit. Because the spirit of God is both here and in heaven. Therefore, the worship that we give unto God must reciprocate what is also happening in heaven. So our worship is not man-made. Because if it is man-made, then it is religion. And God hates religion. There are so many religions in the world. Because religion is a way of man trying to reach God. But worship, true worship and salvation is not man trying to reach God. It is God reaching man. For the Bible says, when we did not know him, when we did not know how to worship him, how to love him, how to abide in him, how to walk in him, when we did not know all these, those things, God knew us because he first loved you. So stop saying you first loved him. He first loved. That is the order of the kingdom of God. He saw you before you saw him. Hallelujah. Because some of you think it's, you, you are the one who, who saw Jesus. You know, and, and you met Jesus the day you got saved. Do you know he met you and he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb? And he ordained that you will be a child of God. You will be restored to the kingdom. He ordained that today you'll be seated here hearing what you're hearing. In God, because the Bible says in Isaiah 46.10, God sees the end from the beginning. 
So God saw today in the eternity because God lives outside of time. God is eternal. That's why the Bible says he is the alpha and the omega. So he's not, the, he's not in the alpha and the omega. He is. Meaning he is outside time. Praise the name of the Lord. So when we are talking of tomorrow, God is not talking of tomorrow. That's why the Bible says in his time, hello somebody, are you with me? In his time, he makes all things beautiful. And his time may not correspond with your time. Hallelujah. So if you are waiting for tomorrow, God is not waiting for tomorrow. Because that's what the Bible says when John saw in Revelation, he said there was no night or a day in heaven. It's because sometimes we think when we are waking up is when God is waking up. But David had a revelation and he said he does not sleep and he does not slumber. He who watches over Jerusalem. He who watches over you. He who watches over the church. He does not sleep or slumber. For him, he is not waking up. Hallelujah. When you're waking up and you're feeling tired, you're thinking, oh God, I thank you that you have woken up also. No. God does not wake up with you. God does not go to sleep. He is the God of all the earth. He runs the earth and the heaven, the moon, the sun, and the galaxies. He does not change. Glory to God. Number three, commit. Now, if you're going to run, focus. It's about committing. So we are talking about follow, organize, commit. Now, somebody who is running, if you're going to be focused, you must commit. When they are told, on your mark, they are committed. They don't even listen to anybody else. People can be there talking. They, know they can be there cheering. They can be doing all. But then they are committed. Now, when it comes to the cause of the gospel and the kingdom of God, God is looking for somebody that will commit. Hello, somebody. You must come to the place of commitment. You must come to the place where you decide I am committed. The reason why some people are not going anywhere, the reason why some people, many people are not making it, it is because they have no commitment. The reason why families fail is lack of commitment. The reason why economies fail is because of lack of commitment. We can talk all we talk. We can talk until roosters come home. We can talk until whatever. But you know what? It is about commitment. It is not what you say. It is what you commit. The runner, the other T, does not say, oh, you know, I can run. Mimi, neither can be. I can run. I can run. And I can be number one. No. He has to go and commit. <laughs> because some of us are left with the talking. You know, I can. I can serve. You know, I can, I can do this, I can tithe. You know, I can preach, I can pray. It's not what you can do, it is what you commit to do. Oh, you know, I can wake up and pray at five o'clock. No, it's not about what you say, it is what you commit. Hallelujah. If you're a young girl and you want to get married, and there's a young man who is pursuing you, and all oh, he comes around for one year, two years, three years, come on, can you commit? I'm not just here taking coffee. We have taken coffee in every restaurant in the, in the city. We, uh, we have been to Uhuru Highway. We have been to River Road. We have been to Grogon. We have been to Vika Road. We have been to Vika. We have been to Kawangware. We have taken coffee. Every restaurant, they know us. Now a time has come when you must commit. Hello. There is a time to commit. Some of you have been saying, oh, yes, I can serve the Lord. I can do it. I can serve. I love serving God. Don't, don't talk about I love serving God. Commit. Commit. Come to the place where you decide, I have now committed. Look at, look at you know, people like you know, Peter, the apostles. Jesus comes and says, follow me. And then he begins to look back and say, look at the business. Look at the, you know, the, 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 the fishing industry. That we have set up for many years. But he decided forgetting all that. I'm committing to follow this man. I don't know what is ahead. I, I, I don't know where we are going. I don't know where he's taking me. But I'm committing to follow him. 
until later on he comes and he says, hey, master, <laughs> we committed. It's now three years. Now we left our families, our business, our children, our wives, everything. Uh, what are we going to get? Please, please explain this to us. Because it looks like, you know, we are just moving on. Miracles there, crusade there, ministry there, feeding the 5,000, doing, you know. What are we going to get? And then Jesus realizes now <laughs> that is the cost of discipleship. That is the cost of commitment. And Jesus says, whoever wants to follow me must take up their cross. Cross means death. It's commitment. Hallelujah. And Jesus says to Peter, you know what, Peter? Anything you have left in my name, whether houses, whether cars, whether family, whether wife, children, anything you have left for the sake of my name, he said, you will get a reward. Peter is not in it. Don't worry. Please don't worry. The reward is coming. You will get a reward how many times? A hundred. Come on. Do you understand what is a hundredfold? You know, Kenya, we have a problem with the mathematics. Do you understand what? A <laughs> hundred. Not ten. He would have said ten. And if you, get, you have a business and you get ten percent profit, it's good enough. But now here he is saying a hundredfold. Ooh, glory to God. That's the kind of business I want. Let me tell you, when you do business with God, he does not pay 50%. He does not pay 99%. He pays 100%. That's why I will do business with God until I go to heaven. That's a good business. Come on, those are good returns. A hundred, anything you leave for the sake of the kingdom. Stop saying I'm sacrificing a lot for God. There's no sacrifice. Is there is profit. Hello. Glory to God. If it was sacrifice, I would be tired after 35 years. I would have said no. It's no sacrifice. Hallelujah. Whether you are walking, it's not sacrifice. You can walk for three miles, but that's not sacrifice. You can walk for 10 kilometers and we have done it. That's not sacrifice. There is a reward. And he said through Hebrews that uh, God is not unjust. That he will forget the labor, the work, everything you have done in his name. Especially serving the saints. God will never forget. Anything you have done in his name, he will not forget. So stop talking of sacrifice. The Bible says after you have done all you are supposed to do, come back and say, I'm not even worthy. It's a privilege. Hello, it's a privilege for me to be serving the Lord. How many would want to serve the Lord? How many are we living wasted lives out there? But us here, God has taken us, cleansed us. We are shining. Hallelujah. We can dress up properly. There are people you went to school with, they don't know even how to dress even today. There are people you went to school with, they are out there drinking and they are in, in, in uh, drugs and uh, and, and the immorality and all kinds. Some of them are buried. They are dead. But look at you. And here you are still thinking I'm sacrificing. There's no sacrifice. It's a commitment. Hallelujah. It's a commitment. And when, when a young man and a young lady commit, they come and say we want to get married. Hello. Because the relationships grow. Our relationship with God also needs to grow. We reach a point of commitment. If you are dating a young girl for five years, seven, ten years, even people begin to wonder, how and in by now? What's happening here? They have been dating for eleven years. Hey, are they okay? Are they, they are growing old. They started when they were twenty-five. Now they are thirty-five. Hi, hi. Some of you have been dating Jesus for twenty-five years. A time has come to commit. And when they commit, they tell us they set a date. And they tell us now we are having a wedding. Let everybody come. Hello? When we call people and we consecrate them, we ordain them, we commit, commission them, it's a commitment. Let, and if people come and oil is poured on you, it is a time of commitment. It's like the wedding where you're saying I have committed to serve him the rest of my life. That's commitment that we need. Will you commit 
to the business of the kingdom. Hallelujah.